seen from Germany, we really are now at the end of the world. We leave New Zealand and head northwards. Our destination is Vanuatu in the Coral Sea between New Zealand and Australia. The actual destination of this part of our journey is northern Australia, more than 3,000 nautical miles away. The crossing to Vanuatu is very rough. A tropical storm is raging up ahead, so we sail as slowly as possible to allow it to pass in front of us. This doesn't quite work out as planned, and we get winds of 14 knots for the best part of two days. The skipper starts to brood. Please God, don't let anything break down now. And then, as happened so often on our journey, in the wake of exertion and deprivation comes paradise. And Vanuatu really is a paradise. The landscape takes us by surprise with its dark green foliage, turquoise waters and pristine sandy beaches. Vanuatu used to be known as the New Hebrides and consists of 83 islands. All the islands put together measure only 12,000 square kilometers in area. By way of comparison, Germany is 360,000 square kilometers in area. 65 of the islands are inhabited. They are home to a total of 260,000 inhabitants. The people live off what they grow in their gardens and fishing. Money is only needed for school and mobile phones. The money isn't just begged from the tourists. Each island cannily works out its own revenue sources. Anaitium in the south is our first Vanuatu island and extends us a warm welcome with local folklore, food and drinks. Its little neighbor, Mystery Island, we find an airport and a few empty stalls. This is because cruise tourists are brought here when a passenger liner happens to pass through. And a big fat cruise ship does indeed heave into view, although it turns away again without letting out any passengers, defeated by the wind and the waves. The inhabitants are disappointed. There'll be no business today. Our next port of call is the island of Tanna. Here there's a yacht club and above all the spectacularly active volcano known as Yasso. We can get as close to the volcano as we want. It's incredible. We take the trip to the volcano in a pickup truck. Ten people on board and thousands of potholes beneath us. Even so, this jungle ride on an open truck bed is great fun. In 1774, marina and explorer James Cook called the island the Lighthouse of the Pacific. The reason for this is the volcano, continuously active for the last 800 years. Mount Yasua is situated on the dividing line between two tectonic plates, or what is known as the Ring of Fire. Plate tectonics force the rim of the caldera a further 15 centimeters upwards every year. Manuato is virtually destroyed over and over again by devastating typhoons, and it's rebuilt time and again. We are particularly touched by the story of Thompson on the island of Tanner, whose dearest wish is to work in New Zealand for a few years as fruit picker so that he can build a storm-resistant stone house in his native village with the money he earns. The island of Ifati is home to the capital, Port Villa, with its many restaurants and stunning shows. The covered market of Port Villa offers everything a marina's heart could possibly desire. We stop here to restock our equipment and thoroughly explore the island. Port Havana is a large bay in the northwest of Ifati. It was in this natural harbor that the Americans simply dumped their surplus material in the sea just after the Second World War. Mountains of Coca-Cola bottles, bulldozers and machines of all types lie on the seabed at the bottom of the bay. Harmful to the environment without doubt, but invisible. The inhabitants of Ifati found out that the Coca-Cola bottles came from different US states and used their collection to set up a small museum. After all, necessity is the mother of invention. To the north of Ifati lies the island of Embrin. The ground trembles to the pounding of the ritualistic tribal dances of men dressed in fantastic costumes. This rom dance is the main source of income for the islanders. We may only be a few sailors, but the sheer number of empty benches offer a clue as to how much cruise ship passengers can be accommodated here.
One more island hop takes us to Panticote, home to the fearless land divers who dive down from dizzling heights. It's hard to believe what these men do. Secured by only vines around their ankles, they climb up onto a tower that hardly inspires confidence and jump fearlessly into the abyss. The length of the vines are precisely measured to allow the face of the diver to sink just a little into the soil that has previously been loosened, which explains the term land diving, literally diving into the land. We leave the paradise of Vanuatu in a westerly direction and set course for Australia. The trip will last nine days. After four days at sea, we narrowly avoid a catastrophe. Due to a leak in the keelbox, the Sturmvogel has quietly taken on water up to the floorboards. That night, we go through all the possible phases of panic, fearing for our boat and indeed for the first time on the trip, for our lives. But Davy Jones' locker doesn't beckon that quickly, particularly as we have the friendly company of the Oda and Southern Star boats around us, and the Australian Coast Guard has rerouted the large Qualin container ship to help us. With everyone's help, the emergency repairs at sea are completed. The leak is sealed with cement. We safely reach Cairns in the northeast of Australia and can repair the Stormvogel at our leisure. We had explored the mainland of Australia in a motorhome a few months earlier during stormy season, so now we decide to travel along the east coast by boat. Warnings about crocodiles are everywhere, but fortunately we only see them in Kern's Zoo. We find out that the northeastern coast of Australia is an area for high-speed sailing. The wind and the currents hustle us northwards, the big Pacific wave remains safely out at sea. The Great Barrier Reef reliably provides us with calm waters. The coast is almost deserted, wild and beautiful. We buy fresh prawns from our fishermen and feast royally amidst the solitude. 